Um, good morning and welcome everybody. Um, we've already exceeded the uh, well-known Italian academic habit, the so-called quarto d'ora accademico, which is the traditional punctual starting time. So according to Italian tradition, we should have started punctually at 9 o'clock. So I apologize um, to those of you who feel that we have been too constrained, excessively constrained by tradition and starting even later. So welcome to everybody here today. I must say that it is a huge honor not only to have the speakers who have agreed to speak today, but also to have such a distinguished audience here at the Italian Academy, um, which I have the privilege to direct here at Columbia. Now, of course, you may well ask, why is this taking place at the Italian Academy? So I'm just going briefly to tell you, I think, why. You know, at Columbia, for a long time, we've been waiting for the existence of our famous, or our sort of famous and new Voloso, I think you will understand this word, Center for Mind, Brain and Behavior. And we are waiting and waiting and it hasn't yet been set up. So when I um, took over the fellowship program at the, the directorship and, the, and introduced the fellowship program here at the Italian Academy in 2000, I realized that perhaps the most exciting area of research both across the humanities and the sciences, I think I can say this to you, was in the field of the neurosciences and it seemed to me that my colleagues, I'm an art historian, it seemed to me that my colleagues in the humanities were neglecting the exciting developments that were happening in the neurosciences, by which I meant both basic neurosciences, of which we can understand very little, and the cognitive neurosciences, of which we can understand perhaps a little something, um, but not much. What I did then was in order to encourage some kind of cross-disciplinary understanding um, and in fact you know one of the things that I realized already at the beginning of the new century was that although uh, people in both fields especially in the humanities talk about interdisciplinarity people really in the humanities haven't the vaguest idea of what happens in a laboratory and so we actually reached out we set up a fellowship program involving young neuroscientists of which Franco Pestilli to whom I will come in a moment <coughs> is a prime example young neuroscientists would come to Colombia, some from Italy, some from other countries in Europe, and work with colleagues in Colombia labs and very occasionally in NYU labs. And in fact, I'm welcoming you here today to neurotechniques, new under approaches to understanding mind, brain, and behavior, which we are running this year in collaboration with the Mahoney Keck Institute, directed by my dear friend and colleague, Mickey Goldberg, whom you all know and with whom it has been a privilege to work and to whom it has been a privilege to supply, I think, some fellows over the course of the years. Neurotechniques is in fact our fifth annual conference devoted either to the neurosciences or to the crossover between the neurosciences and the humanities. The first was a remarkable conference we had in 2006, um, which we arranged in conjunction with um, Eric Kandel and Richard Axel, um, Art and the New Biology of Mind. That was one of the first intense crossover experiments in this area. I like to think that it was a little more rigorous than other um, efforts in the field of neuroaesthetics, one of these portmanteau terms that have become so popular in the last few years. We then had a conference dedicated to mirror neurons. We have been working here in conjunction with the now controversial team in Parma. We had a conference thereafter on art and vision science in which we had some of the vision people from Harvard come down, Pat Kavanagh, Marge Livingston and so on. Then after that, last year, a hugely successful conference on attention and emotion. We had the big people in John Reynolds, Steve Yantis, many others also from NYU and Columbia. Um, and that was a great um, breakthrough, I feel, for the Academy and indeed for Columbia because who would have thought that a serious conference on attention would fill the hall, this great theater of the Italian Academy? It did. And so now I have to tell you that when I was in Berlin, actually I was giving a lecture at the Charité because they have a mind, brain and behavior center there which they've set up in Berlin last year and I got a message from our fellow last year, Franco Pestilli, um, 
saying that he thought we might have a conference dedicated to new systems of recording, um, magnetic, optical, and molecular imaging, and of course now with the presence of John Dysrot later this afternoon, optogenetically targeted neural, neural control. And I said to him, goodness me, I said, Franco, this sounds really interesting, but will a single person outside the neurosciences come? So I thought on this, and then I thought, no, this is an important, <laughs> this is an important conference. We're going to do it anyway. We have to do it. It's a lively and active area, and um, you know we'll see who comes. And so here you all are. I couldn't extend a warmer welcome to you. I think um, we have put together a great team of experts. You know their names all. I mean they're famous. You can see them on the list. Um, but I just want to thank not only you speakers, you. Who come to participate in today's discussions, not only Franco Pestilli, who actually came to us, I think he was once in Italy a while back, but I know that he has actually worked with Marisa Carrasco and David Heger, whom I'm happy to see here today, but also with Vince Ferreira, who I think here at Columbia, who I think cannot be unfortunately here today. Um, but not only Franco, Franco really you, I think we should give a round of applause because Franco has really organized this whole thing and we won't have it. You'll see him in a minute, I won't make him rise. Um, but I also want to extend uh, my thanks and our thanks we all need to extend really to my, the wonderful staff we have here at the Italian Academy. I was very happy to hear Mickey say to me that he was happy to be here because it involved so little work and um, we did all the work or I should rather say that the team of Abigail Asher, Nick Boninkontri and Alison Jeffrey and our many work studies over here really worked hard to make this event efficient, auspicious, and pleasant. So I wish you all well. I wish you well for the deliberations today. I'm going to try and follow as much as I myself can, seeing these are issues I'm, some of which I'm writing about right at the moment. So um, buon lavoro, as we say in Italian. Good work, good research, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Franco Pestilli, who will introduce the morning's proceedings. Thank you so much all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so the first speaker is Michael, Michael uh, Goldberg. Michael is the director of the Mahoney Center here at Columbia. He's an MD, and he got his MD from Harvard. He's been in the field for more than 27 years and working on uh, neurophysiology of attention in non-human primates. Everyone knows uh, Michael, and he's been the, the president of the Neuroscience Society. His work is very, very established, and he's an extremely uh, energetic person. He <laughs> runs the center, does science, and he's also working as a physician. It's amazing the energy that he can pull out. And today he's going to talk about some of his work and give a nice lecture about the introduction of uh, the, the beginning of neurophysiology. Thank you. This is always the moment of anguish. Yes. Ah. Okay. Ah, if you want to listen. Grazie Franco e David. Mi piace di parlare in questa sala grande del caso italiano, ma il mio italiano è quello di un bambino di 15 mesi, so I am going to have to talk in English. Uh, so, single unit recording, uh, or come on, this is the 20th century, 21st century. So, so why do single cell recording from a single microelectrode? It allows you to study the properties of cells very carefully and exhaustively. Um, we like to call it paleo neurophysiology. Um, 
But sometimes even Barney wants to know something about the receptive field, about, uh, about latency, about functional anatomy. And so we're going to start with a bit of history. Um, it's really fun to go back to see what neurophysiology was like 100 years ago. In the 20s, uh, Lord Adrian discovered unitary potentials in peripheral nerves. And in 1926, Adrian and Bronck showed that the pattern of the activity of units in the phrenic nerve of the rabbit correlates with respiratory motion and respiratory force. Um, in 1940, um, Renshaw of the spinal Renshaw cell was the first to convincingly record single cortical units. He did it in the, in the hippocampus and showed, first of all, that he could sh see what he called spike-like potentials in hippocampal white matter, and second, that he could actually drive this by uh, stimulating the, um, the output of the entorhinal cortex as it goes into the, to the hippocampus. And so it was, in fact, possible now to record the activity of single neurons in the cortex. And then came the war. But in 1953, Vaya Masian, who is still active at Downstate, um, used single metal electrodes to record neurons in a cortical track. And he showed that he could drive neurons in cat somatosensory cortex um, from either stimulating the ulnar nerve or by actually touching the animal. In 1955, David Hubel invented the lacquer-coated tungsten electrode um, and began, and he and Vernon Mountcastle began what has now become the great tradition of cortical electrophysiology. Okay, so I thought I would show you a bit from Adrian and Bronck. First of all, um, he didn't have a microelectrode, he had a rather gross electrode. So the way he was able to get to a single phrenic nerve fiber was to dissect the nerve. And so these are the stages of nerve dissection in the original paper. And this was, the, was two spikes during normal respiration of the rabbit, lightly anesthetized with chlorolose, a, uh, a technique that we no longer use. Um, but then if he clamped the endotracheal tube, increasing the force that the animal had to do to, to, to respire, the um, frequency of firing of the, of the phrenic nerve potentials um, increased. And that was a very profound observation. It said that you could understand something about the nervous system by looking at the pulse code coming out of a single neuron. Okay, so I am going to show you some experiments that we've done applying single microelectric electrode recording to a cognitive problem. And that cognitive problem is this. So the only way that visual information enters the brain is via the retina. The retina is constantly moving. The same spatial location can appear at many different locations on the retina. And then how can the brain construct a spatially accurate representation of the world for action despite a moving eye? Um, this is kind of a, an, an example of the problem. This is Leukerbad. It's about 80 kilometers east of Geneva in the Valais. And so you're looking at, this, at, at the town and you're looking at a house over here. And so there is the retinal receptive field. But if you look at the forest, that same retinal receptive field is on the gemipas. And if you look at the hotel, the retinal receptive field is on the little T-bar slope. So how can you take these vastly disparate retinal messages and turn it in to a representation that enables you to reach out and touch something or to look at it or to throw a baseball at it? So the oculomotor version of the problem is that saccades are made to a point in space, not to a point in the, on the retina. We call it the double step task. You ask a human or a monkey to look at a spot of light, and then you flash two spots. And you ask the subject to make sequential saccades to those two flashed lights. So try it. Look at the fixation point and make the two saccades. 
Well, the first account is easy because the location of the that first target on the retina um, tells you exactly the vector of the saccade to make. But the second saccade is difficult because the retinal message is go downward to the right, but the real world message is to go directly to the right. So in order to solve the task, the patient or the subject must update the, re the representation of the target at B to compensate f for the saccade from fixation point to A. Okay, so it turns out that despite the fact that this requires an immense amount of computation, it's not a problem. Um, humans can do it. Hallett and Lightstone made that first observation when people thought about the, about the saccadic system as being tied down to the, um, to, to the retina. And monkeys can do it. Sparks and Mays demonstrated that quite nicely and in fact showed neurons in that neurons in the monkey superior colliculus were not fooled um, by this problem and that neurons that had motor activity would always give the right signal regardless of the sensory input. The first person to think about this in a, in a truly creative way was Hermann von Helmholtz, uh, not Italian, but one of the most brilliant people I think who ever lived. He made contributions to physiology, to ophthalmology, and those of you who took physical chemistry probably remember at least the name Helmholtz Free Energy. He noted that a patient who woke up one day with an abducens palsy, sixth nerve palsy, can't look laterally, um, had the illusion that the world moved in the opposite direction when he tried to make an eye movement even though the eye didn't move. And his insight was that the brain maintains a spatial accuracy despite a moving eye by using the motor command to predict where the eye will move and therefore compensate for the change in retinal position. Helmholtz called the signal originating in the motor system that affects the sensory system, the sense of effort. And more recently, the signal has been called efferent copy or corollary discharge. So what's the physiology of efferent copy? From the clinic, we know that the parietal cortex is necessary for actual, accurate spatial perception and for compensating for a subject's own movement because patients with parietal lesions can't do it. And so we are going to look, and that's we is a huge number of people whose names will unfold as this story goes on. Um, let's look at one particular area of the parietal cortex, the lateral interparietal area. Now, why the lateral interparietal area? Um, it was defined in the 80s by Richard Anderson and Chieko Asanuma who showed that it had very strong oculomotor projections. Now, this is, LIP lies actually in the intraparietal sulcus. This is the monkey brain. This is the back of the head. This is where the nose is. And Anderson showed that there, this very strong projections to and from the frontal eye field, to and from the superior colliculus. The colliculus projection comes back via the thalamus, so it's a disynaptic projection. So, so you look at that and you think it's a member of the um, oculomotor system, which in fact it is, but it also has very powerful visual connections. It gets pr projections from V4, also V3A and, and MT. It, in particular, as projections to and from inferior temporal cortex, an area with little spatial activity but with a huge amount of pattern um, activity, and also from parahippocampal gyrus, which is important in spatial memory. So this area lies astride of the visual, oculomotor, and spatial systems. Okay, quick review of LIP. Um, in the 1990s, uh, Richard Anderson said LIP represents intention, and uh, the Goldberg Lab said LIP represents attention. Um, in, the in the 21st century, um, I was in the basement of the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and I saw this installation by Esther Partegas. She called it the invisible, and what she said that there has to be coexistence between attention and intention. So I emailed her and I said, how did you figure that one out. And she said, well, attention is how you deal with the outside world. And attention is how you deal with the inside world. And you have to do both. So, so I think that we really can think of LIP as uh, the paradigm of coexistence. And so the way we think of it now is that LIP represents a priority map. 
it tells you what's important in the world, and it's used by the visual system to choose a locus of attention, even when the, attend the attended object cancels a planned saccade. But it's used by the ocular motor system to drive saccades when saccades are appropriate. In visual search, LIP predicts the goal and latency of the impending saccade. So it's doing both things simultaneously. Anna Ipata was a fellow of the Casa Italiana. And the priority map is spatially accurate. Both perception and action require a spatially accurate signal. But parietal neurons have a problem. LIP describes the world in a retinotopic frame, a vector relative to the fovea in visual coordinates. So how can it do the double step task where we've got to go beyond the retina? So let's look at what happens to the visual receptive field around the time of a saccade. And this is an experiment that was done many years ago by um, Jean-René Duhamel and Carol Colby in my lab. Uh, so you ha ask a monkey to look at a fixation point, and when he's looking at, a rece reception, uh, at the fixation point, this is where the receptive field is. Then you flash a target that is not in the receptive field, and the target goes out. And you ask the monkey now to make a saccade, give him a saccade target, the fixation point goes out, a saccade target comes on, and the saccade target is not in the receptive field of the neuron. And the monkey makes a saccade, and that saccade brings the receptive field onto the spatial location of the vanished stimulus. So what I didn't make clear is that the, that stimulus appears and then it goes out. So now there's nothing on the screen and when the monkey makes the saccade, there's nothing in the receptive field. What happens? So, so now LIP visual neurons, like all classical neurons, have receptive fields relative to the center of gaze. So this neuron likes it when the monkey looks here and this, that stimulus comes on in that spatial location. It, likes it. it doesn't fire very much when it's looking over here. The stimulus isn't in the receptive field. There's no response. LIP neurons, though, remap their receptive fields around the time of every saccade. So if a monkey is looking here, monkey makes a saccade to there, the stimulus comes and goes before the eyes move. This is horizontal and vertical eye position. This is a, this is a raster diagram. I didn't explain every dot on it previously, but each dot is the um, appearance of an action potential each uh, line is an individual trial. Successive trials are synchronized on an event. In this case, the appearance, the, the beginning of the saccadic eye movement. And this histogram sums the activity of the single trials above. This is um, kind of like the electrophoretic gel for systems neuroscience. Okay, so the monkey, when he makes a saccade and the stimulus isn't, has not recently appeared in the receptive field, the cell doesn't fire much. It does fire a bit, that's a memory uh, effect, and I will show you that in, in um, detail later. Okay, so uh, the, the two control experiments, which I, I won't show you, are that also well, so what I've shown you is that in order for this effect to happen, there has to be a combination of a stimulus whose ghost will be brought into the receptive field by the saccade, that the saccade alone or flashing the stimulus in its spatial location, if it happens not to be in the receptive field, are not, uh, are, are not sufficient to drive the cell. But this explains how um, LIP can provide the proper signal to the superior colliculus in the double step saccade. So the first saccade is easy. But I, what I want you to do is I want you to think about three neurons. The guy whose receptive field is at A, the guy whose re receptive field is at B when the monkey's looking, and the guy whose receptive field would need to be stimulated after the saccade uh, in order to drive the proper movement, and um, there's nothing in his receptive field. But after the saccade, we now know that that the cell with the horizontal receptive field will fire as a result of that first saccade bringing the spatial location of the vanished stimulus into the receptive field. And it turns out that the activity of the cells at A and B um, will go away as a result of, of the saccade. Okay, so remapping can even precede the saccade. So this is the um, response to a stimulus in the receptive field. 
This is the response to a stimulus outside the receptive field. This is that what happens when the saccade brings the stimulus into the receptive field. And note, this cell fires even before the eye begins to, to, to start. So whatever is causing that remapping must be an efferent copy. It must be a corollary discharge. It's the motor system saying what it's going to do and feeding back, like Helmholtz said, to um, affect the sensory system. And then when the monkey makes the saccade alone again, uh, with, with no stimulus, there's no response. All right. So this is the advantage of studying a cell with, a sing with spending a long time studying one cell. Because look at what we have to do. We have to work out the receptive field. We have to show what the movement field is. We have to sh demonstrate the receptive field remapping. Um, one cell, Barney. And it turns out that, that 40, 42 of 132 neurons discharge earlier than would be predicted by their visual latency, and 23 of 132 precede the saccade. And this is what we call the adjusted perisaccadic latency. Each dot is a cell ordered by latency. And so you see for this population of cells, they're all affected by that extra retinal corollary discharge signal. Okay, receptive field remapping is not limited to LIP. It is found in the superior colliculus, in frontal eye field, uh, V4, V3A, a few even in V1, and in the parietal reach area. Um, and that was uh, Aaron Batista and Richard Anderson. And in, in a wonderful experiment, uh, perhaps the, the pinnacle of single neuron recording, um, Bob Wirtz and Mark Summer showed that the frontal eye field shift arises from a corollary signal from the superior colliculus, which is relayed by the medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, but the story is a bit more complicated. Um, I say everybody can do the double step task, but I lied. The compensation is not perfect. And so we, we being Morgan Jeffries and I, ask monkeys to make a saccade to stimuli appeared, appearing for 50 milliseconds before, during, and after an intervening saccade. And it turns out that around the time of the saccade, stimuli are mislocalized in the direction opposite the saccade. Okay, so what we've plotted here, so what we're doing is we're asking a monkey to make a saccade, flashing a target before, during, and after the saccade, um, and asking the monkey to make a saccade to that second target. So if the stimulus occurs 500 milliseconds before the saccade, and then the monkey makes a saccade, bringing the spatial location of that vanished stimulus into the receptive field, the monkey does perfectly well. And he does perfectly well if you flash the stimulus 500 milliseconds after the saccade. But here we're, plat we're, we're plotting the saccade error as a function of the time F, the time at which the stimulus disappears relative to the beginning of the saccade. So everything here, the stimulus appears and disappears, but you see there begins to creep in a bit of an error which continues for a rather long time, 200, mil, 200 milliseconds or so. So something else is going on to degrade the accuracy of that behavior. Why is the system less accurate around the time of a saccade? Well, we can think of two sources of error. The first is, what does the parietal cortex represent? Does it tell you where the, where the stimulus is on the visual field? Or does it tell you what is the movement going to be? And the second is, around the time of the saccade, is there in fact some, neuro, some neuronal ambiguity? And those could be the sources of error. And so we decided to look at those questions in, um, in the lab. All right. So the first question is, what does the priority map represent? Now, visual coordinates is at the location of the target, but movements are not all, always accurate. So the visual st stimulus is telling you within the visual error where the target is, um, but the movement may not necessarily be accurate. And anybody who is the parent of a child or has graduate students can, can tell you that um, you tell them to do something, right? That's the location of the, of, of the sensory stimulus. But did they actually do it? And did they do it accurately? Uh, for my children, the answer is rarely. Um, so, not, not however for my graduate students, I'm delighted to say. Uh, or motor coordinates, the actual movement amplitude. Now, if you had an estimate of the motor 
of what was the movement. That would be more accurate than knowing what the target is. So to answer this question, we, we being Sarah Steenrod and Matt Phillips, used saccadic adaptation. Okay. Now, saccadic adaptation is a trick. Um, you're blind during a saccade. And you can do this experiment by standing in front of a mirror, looking at your left eye, looking at your right eye, and ask, did you see your eye move? Um, and if you, and, and you will s realize that you don't. Then you get, if you are lucky enough to have one, your significant other or a friend, um, to stand next to you and have that person look at his or her eye, um, right eye, left eye, and ask yourself, do you see that eye move in the mirror? And of course you do. So you're blind during a saccade, and McLaughlin in the, in, in the 60s took advantage of this to show that he could change the gain of the saccadic system. And so this is an example of what happens with a monkey. Um, we're, we're plotting eye position against target position over here, and this is uh, against time. So the monkey is looking at the target, and then the target jumps, and the, and the eye begins to move, and during that motion, the target comes out, and it comes back on at a different position after the saccade. And so the monkey makes a mistake. He goes to where the target had been, and then he makes a corrective. But over 500 to 800 trials, the oculomotor system gradually recalibrates, and adapted saccades now go directly to the shifted, or close to the shifted target location. So that's the first saccade, that's the second saccade. They're both made to the same target. But the monkey has figured out that he's got to change the gain of his saccade. This is not a cognitive trick. Um, you, when we do this with a human, you're not aware of the shift. And the monkey, instead of waking up and say, hey, those guys just moved the target, gradually adapts the amplitude of his saccade over several hundred trials. Now the way we did the experiment is first work out the receptive field of the neuron. And so the monkey looks over here, and this is a heat map of where we can drive the cell when the monkey fixates. We give the monkey then a number of different saccade targets, um, and we change the, we, we step the target a certain percent of that distance. So we're looking at, at gain change rather than actual um, degrees of motion of change. And what we see is this is before, and the monkey uh, undershoots a bit, which is normal. And then we gradually increase the, the step size, and the monkey changes um, the amplitude of his saccade that he's making to that target in response to the, um, the, the demands of adaptation. But look, it goes very, very slowly. And so, for um, analytic purposes, we define a pre-adaptation and a post-adaptation signal, which is one rate constant after the um, gain that of the saccade changes, and it quite nicely fits to an exponential. Okay. So the gain of adaptation is uniform. This is pre-adaptation. This is post-adaptation. Um, the mean saccade amplitude plotted against the target location. And so we're going to look now at your classic LIP neuron, a neuron that gives activity during the memory-guided delayed saccade task, where we ask the monkey to look at a spot of light. Another, another one comes on in the visual field, uh, goes out, monkey fixates for some time longer, and then he makes a saccade to the spatial location of that vanished stimulus. This requires memory. Um, and so we can analyze the activity of the neuron in three different phases. Uh, the visual response to the appearance of the target, this delay period response, and the pre saccadic response. Well, it's pretty apparent that the visual response uh, is going to be in, in, in visual coordinates, right? Um, so under conditions of saccadic adaptation, the visual responses of LIP neurons in the delayed saccade task is in vi visual coordinates. And so what we've done, we being um, Sarah and Matt, um, after adaptation and before adaptation, plot the mean neural response as a function of the target location. And what you can see is that long, the two lines superimpose. In fact, the, there's a slight neural shift, um, which we calculate by um, looking at the change of the median 
median response plus or minus half a um, delayed plus or minus a standard devi deviation, half a standard deviation. So, so this is the visual response is in, is in visual coordinates. Not surprising. And so if we plot it against saccade amplitude, so this is mean response against the um, saccade that's associated with, with that, that response, um, what you see is that that shifts. So the same spike count, which is associated with the 35 degree eye movement, is after adaptation associated with a 25 degree eye movement. And in fact, we can calculate the neural shift as the difference in, in in these curves. And under conditions of saccadic adaptation, visual responses of LIP neurons in the delayed saccade task is in visual coordinates. This is neural shift in visual coordinates. This is neural shift in, in um, motor coordinates. And you see the, the neural shift doesn't change as a function of adaptation magnitude for visual, but it does for motor. And this slope is pretty close to one. OK, so the visual responses and visual coordinates, big deal. But remember, LIP neurons have this pre saccadic burst right before the saccade. This is, and the combination of the visual response, the delayed period response, and the motor response are what define the activity of LIP neurons. And what happens then to the motor response? And the answer is exactly the same thing that the pre saccadic response of LIP neurons in the delayed saccade task is in visual coordinates. So this is the, the motor. Um, analysis, and that's the visual analysis. So what LIP is telling the, the superior colliculus and the frontal eye field and the rest of the brain is where is the target location and not what is the saccade. So that's clearly one source of perisaccadic uh, inac inaccuracy. Okay. Um, what about the signal that shifts the receptive field, this um, Carl Efren's copy signal? that um, shifts the, re the receptive field um, and shows up before the saccade. So in this experiment, we have the monkey make a saccade from here, to, from here to there. We work out the receptive field of the neuron. So when the monkey is looking here, that's the receptive field. We do saccadic adaptation. So the target is here. The movement is there. And we then um, look at what happens of to stimuli that are going to be brought into the receptive field um, and see how does that change as a function of adaptation. And so this is the visual, the memory guided the delayed saccade response of the neuron. This is the saccade to the future receptive field. This is um, making the saccade without the movement. And this is the, um, the pre-saccadic um, change in response. So, so this, it, it, it's often small, as it is in this cell. This is a, a um, reafferent response here. But, but notice the cell isn't firing at all. And then it starts to fire before the saccade. So it's getting a pre-saccadic uh, pre efferent copy signal. And it turns out that if we look at spikes per second as a function of probe location, there is no change. Even the efferent copy is in visual coordinates. So rather, so all the cortex knows, or at least LIP knows, is what the visual system is telling the saccadic system. And it doesn't know what the saccadic system actually did, which is going to provide a source of error for targets that are flashed around the time of a saccade. OK, so one source of error, LIP, is calibrated in visual coordinates. Now, a second source of error is in the nature of the receptive field shift itself. So how does the receptive field shift? You, and to do that experiment, uh, Shalon Wang and Ming-Chi Zhang and I designed um, this experiment, where we asked the monkey to fixate. And when he fixates here, this is a current receptive field. When he fixates there, this is an intermediate receptive field. And we ask him to make a saccade from one to the other. And the saccade. Um, will move the receptive field across that a trajectory. And so we can probe an intermediate location and ask whether or not, around the time of the saccade, this cell also, um, this, this um, location also, will drive the cell. OK. Now, uh, this, I have to apologize for the complexity of this, uh, of, of this slide, but 
I don't know of any, way, any other way to do it. So this is the activity in the current receptive field, um, synchronized on the beginning of the saccade. And the red line is the appearance and disappearance of the target, um, that, that probe target. Remember, the, the saccade uh, target is not in the receptive field of the neuron. So if there's no probe target, there's no response. This is no probe target down here. And what you see is that the cell responds to the probe target and the activity of this, this later phasic response, tonic response is truncated by the beginning of the saccade. The um, abrupt onset of the target provides a, a strong enough signal that it can break through that, that suppression and ultimately the target is taken out of the receptive field. Okay, so that's not news. But we now look at the intermediate location, well before the saccade, if, it, if the stimulus appears well before the saccade, it doesn't fire. If it appears well after the saccade, it doesn't fire. But around the time of the saccade, the cell starts to fire. And it fires even um, for stimuli that come and go before the eye actually begins to move. And if we look at the future receptive field, we see this nice um, afferent copy signal and, and, and a reafferent signal. Um, and what, so what you see is that, that around the time of the saccade, three different retinal locations can drive the single cell, which means that during the time of the saccade, three different populations of cells are active. Those looking at the current receptive field, those looking at the future receptive field, and those looking at some place in the middle as the receptive field expands like a big banana along the trajectory of the saccade. And if we look at a point in space which is not along that trajectory, it doesn't drive the cell. So, so this is the second source of perisaccadic ambiguity that, in fact, a much larger population of cells are neuro, uh, cells fire, and depending on how those cells, the activity of those cells are weighted, there will be a saccadic error. Okay, so efferent's copy is inaccurate. Is there a better way to provide spatial accuracy? And the answer to that is yes. And Ewald Herring, who was Helmholtz's great opponent, postulated that the brain solved the problem of spatial accuracy by measuring exactly where the eyes are in the orbit. And for that, you need ocular motor proprioception. And we have recently discovered that the monkey's somatosensory cortex has a, rep has a proprioceptive representation of eye position. So this is a cell that has a tonic representation of eye position. Um, the monkey is looking up here, and the cell fires a lot, and the monkey looks down here, and the cell doesn't fire ter terribly much. And the monkey looks here, and the cell fires in the middle. Um, the representation follows the eye movement, and when we were just sort of working this out, people would come and visit in the lab, and I'd show them this cell, and I'd say, where is it? And they'd say, oh, LIP, or the frontal eye fields, the superior colliculus, knowing um, my habits. But it turns out to be nine millimeters down from the cortical surface beneath cells with tactile receptive fields on the contralateral brow. It's in the, in the in area 3A of the somatosensory cortex. And so this is, uh, that, that, that's an, an MRI of the electrode. Um, and, you know, normal science, all the cells have it. The cells are tuned in a Gaussian manner for amplitude. Uh, all directions of orbital position are represented in each hemisphere. So it's not that the left hemisphere is looking at the right side of the orbit. The left hemisphere is looking at the, in, at the right eye. And no, there are no peaks along the pulling directions of individual muscles, which says that area 3A or the thalamus to which it, to, that projects to it um, is doing some kind of integration among adjacent muscles. Um, the cells have linearly increasing responses from positions around the center of gaze. Um, cells have tonic and phasic components to their discharge. And notice when a monkey goes from, optical, from optimal to null, the cell shuts up. When the cell goes from null to op optimal, it gives a phasic burst. But the tonic response is, is, is roughly the same. In, in both cases. Interestingly enough, this says, and we, we found out that there's no relationship between this burst and, say, eye velocity. It's just what spindles do. 
Okay. And the on and off response latency are correlated. So the question is, where does I position signal come from? And the answer is the contralateral orbit. So the way we do this experiment is Dr. Wang gives the monkey free rewards to make him happy. Dr. Zhang holds down the monkey's eyelid. And Dr. Goldberg puts a needle through the lid into the orbit puts two and a half cc's of lidocaine into the orbit, and um, that paralyzes the eye. So, so notice that this is before the block, the cell gives what you would, you know, the expected position signal. During the block, the cell continues to fire, but it fires much less, and it doesn't, and, and, and it doesn't respond around the time of the eye movement, even though the, eye, the other eye is moving perfectly well, which means that all of the efferent's copy signals that are going on in the brain are still going on. And the only thing that isn't the same is the fact that nothing is coming out of the orbit or going into the orbit. And it's true in both directions, and, and as the lidocaine goes away, the, um, the signal comes back. So, so this is a... This, this then is a um, sensory signal coming from the, op from the opposite orbit. So the cortex then has a more accurate estimate of where the eyes are in, in the orbit that comes from actual measurement, Herring's idea. Okay, so saccades, as you saw, conflate phasic and tonic responses. And so we wanted to see what was the, the minimum timing of this response, we being Yixing Shu and Chris Peck and I, or actually Yixing Shu and, and Shalon Wang uh, at the beginning, and, 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 and Chris Peck. So what happened was you have the monkey doing smooth pursuit in a sinusoidal fashion, and then you see the neuron fires. It's a rather noisy signal, but um, the eye position and neuronal signals have similar power spectra. That's a good thing. And we decided to look to use the maximum cross covariance to determine the lag. So we look at a cross covariance between the eye position and the neuron, and the red is cross covariance between eye position and neuron. The, the blue is the cross covariance between neuron and neuron, and the green is, is a shuffle signal. And so the cross covariance is fairly good. And then we ask, what is the maximum by, by changing the time lag of the cross covariance, what is the maximum time? And it turned out for this neuron at 62 mill milliseconds. And, and, and that was the average among about 30 cells. So we wanted to know then whether or not this signal um, was independent of, say, the motor commands going to the, to the eye movement or, and the visual um, events evoked by the, the target. And so what we used was the vestibular ocular reflex, where we had the monkey f um, look at a target in space and then rotate the monkey in his chair. So what happens is that we're getting the same eye movement, but the visual, th the, the visual activity in the orbit uh, in, on the retina is very different. In one case it's still, in the other case it's moving, and there's no difference. We see exactly the same thing. This is another neuron. It's, it has a um, 60 or so millisecond cross covariance, and for the same cell, for the few cells whose maxima were horizontal, we could show that the VOR delay and the pursuit delay measured by this cross covariance method were identical. The R squared is 0.93 out of six cells. Um, one of the reviewers said, you don't have a lot of cells here. I said, R squared equals 0.93. Uh, the, so the proprioceptive representation of eye position lies in area 3A in the floor of the central sulcus, in the representation of the trigeminal nerve where the skeletal muscle spindles lie in the skeletal re representations. What those sensors are is actually a, a, a matter of intense debate right now. Um, and it arises from contralateral eye, usually, presumably from muscle sensors, and as I said, that's a, a, a really hot topic in the um, muscle world. And it represents all eye positions. And it lags the eye by an average of 60 milliseconds. And this could provide Herring's measurement of eye position and generate a spatially accurate late signal. Okay. Now, one way in which the um, spindles could be providing a, a signal is... Is that two minutes left or? Okay. <laughs> I, 
prepare your hook, um, is, is through the gain fields. And um, Richard Anderson and, and Vernon Mountcastle discovered a long time ago that the, um, ac the visual activity of parietal neurons is modulated by the position of the eye in the orbit. And that's wonderful because it, and, and they were, the, the gain field, this, this um, orbital modulation, lies in a plane, has it, the identical um, characteristics as the proprioceptive signal. And, but the nice thing is that the target position in space can be calculated from the gain fields. And so Zipcher and Anderson showed that, and, and then uh, Puget and Shinovsky used another mathematical method, and uh, Salinas and Abbott used still a third mathematical method. So there's this signal that's wonderfully tractable. So, so you can say, okay, you're gonna ma you make an eye movement immediately after the eye movement, flash a target in space, and the gain fields know by using this orbital position modulation of visual, uh, of visual activity, they know where the target is in space. And from that, you can easily solve the double step tag. The motor system, rather than bothering with a retinal signal, just has to know where it is in space. And then it, you can calculate where you're going to make the movement. And so uh, Yixing Shu and Karine Karachi and I decided to look at what is the time course of gain fields. Now, if they're fast, they could arise from efferent's copy, be usable for calculating targets for action immediately after a saccade, but they might be inaccurate. On the other hand, if they're slow, they could arise from oculomotor proprioception, not be usable for calculating targets for, for action immediately after a saccade, but they could be accurate. So we did a simple experiment. We had the monkey fixate, make a saccade, and then sometime after that saccade flash a target. And we then said, how did the gain fields change? So, at, so what we've done is we asked the monkey to make a saccade from a high to a low gain field position. And we randomly interleave the delay immediately after a saccade. And then we it randomly interleave trials of different delays. And what we found is that from saccades from high to low gain position, uh, the cell gives the high pre-saccadic gain field for at least 150 milliseconds and is correct by 250 milliseconds. If the monkey goes back the other way from a low to a high gain field position, it gives the low gain field position for the same 150 milliseconds and then gives the high gain field position. So this cell, if you ask the monkey to make a saccade and then give him a double step target, he's going to not do well because the gain field signal is is inaccurate for 150 milliseconds after a saccade. But nonetheless, the monkey can make the, that saccade perfectly accurately, which I don't have time to show you because of uh, Franco's hook. Um, so what that means is that there is a signal which by virtue of its slowness is likely to be proprioceptive, therefore likely to be accurate, but is slow. Which suggests then that this is used to calibrate the system. Maybe it's responsible for the signal that, that enables saccadic adaptation, for example. It says, hey, you were wrong. And, and, and then, but what it's not useful for is online action. So, I don't nearly, and I'm never going to get to environmental memory. Sorry, Sarah, it's cool, but it's a lot of time. <sighs> yeah, bad person. Okay, so the technique of recording the activity of signal units with microelectrodes may be antiquated, but it's still powerful. And so who really did the work, as I said, Carol Colby and John Renee Duhamel did the original shifting receptive field experiment. Morgan Jeffries studied the accuracy of saccades to targets flashed around the time of an intervening saccade. Ming Xia Zhang and Shalan Wang discovered the oculomotor proprioceptive signal, studied the fine structure of receptive field shifts. Yixing Xu and Chris Peck studied the tonic component of the proprioceptive and, and Shalan Wang studied the tonic component of the proprioceptive signal. And Yixing Xu and Karin Karachi did the gain field study. Thank you. We have time for a quick question, if there's any. Sure. Uh, one quick question. As you uh, can you say your name? I'm Pascal. How are you doing? Hi. Um, as you stated, the technique might be old, 
but it's still useful that even now it is valid for answer specific target questions. How do you see the future of this method? Well, I think when, when, whenever you need compulsively and obsessively to study the properties of a neuron, if you've got a hundred neurons, um, you're not going to be able to use that kind of detail that all of the examples that I showed you uh, required. So as, as, as long as there are um, questions which can be answered only by obsession and compulsion, um, that is to say, as long as there are still neurologists, uh, I think there's still going to be microelectrode studies or couple, we're, we're now doing shutter two microelectrode studies in the lab and looking at cross correlations. But again, two microelectrodes, we have the time to work out the properties in, in a compulsive way of each of the two neurons. So then we really know, can, can interpret what, what is involved in their cross correlation.